call to worship. The words will be on the screen. God is in our midst, forming us to be God's own people. Though the way may be difficult, God will be with us. We need not fear. Come to the Lord who will surround you and strengthen you.
Good morning, my little angels. So when the girls were little, one of my favorite books that I read to them was Llama Llama Red Pajama. I love this book. And in this story, baby llama starts to fret because he feels alone at night in his bed. And he gets so scared that he becomes out of control. And he yells and yells for his mama. When his mom gets near, she says, Mama Llama is always near, even if she's not right here. And that helped bring baby llama a lot of comfort. You know, in our lives, we're going to feel alone too. We're going to be afraid because we feel like there's no one else that maybe understand what we're going through or is with us. But the thing is, our Heavenly Father promises us something even better. He says that I am always near and I am always here. We are never alone because our God is with us. And that is something that we can count on. So the next time that you're afraid of being alone, trust that our God is with you because he is. Now, I look forward to seeing you um, this week during our Z groups. I'll talk to you later. Bye. Good morning, church family. As we enter into a time of prayer this morning, I ask that you would keep these that will be listed on your screen in your prayers this week. And now would you pray with me? Holy God, we come to you this morning with thanksgiving, praying for for these that uh, are on our hearts, our family and our friends. Father, we just ask your blessing on each one. We ask for healing. We ask for strength. And we'll give you praise and thanksgiving for that. And Lord, we ask for Direction for the leaders of our country. Father, let them hear your voice as the decisions are made. We lift up those on the front lines. Father, our nurses and doctors and hospital workers, uh, first responders. Lord, we pray that you keep them safe. Keep them healthy as they uh, seek to, to keep us healthy. And, Lord, for our schools and our students, teachers, school workers, Father, we pray for safety for them. Lord, I lift up our pastor as she teaches and preaches us. And I pray that, uh, that our hearts will be open, our minds will be open as we seek to grow, as we worship together this morning. And now, Lord, we pray the prayer that... Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now as we uh, take a moment to return to God part of what he has given us with our tithes and our offerings, we ask the Lord to bless those to the building of his kingdom. Now here's Harriet McCreary as she sings, His Eye is on the Sparrow. i 
Good morning to you all. It is good to be in worship with you again this morning. I am grateful as always to all of those who are uh, working, providing our uh, worship leadership in, in front of the camera and behind um, and from home and everywhere else. It's so good to have um, these great folks who are helping us come together in worship. And as we do come together this morning around God's word, I'll be reading out of the Psalms. One of my favorite psalms is 139. I'll be reading the first 10 verses. Lord, you have examined me. You know me. You know when I sit down and when I stand up. Even from far away, you comprehend my plans. You study my traveling and resting. You are thoroughly familiar with all my ways. There isn't a word on my tongue, Lord, that you don't already know completely. You surround me front and back. You put your hand on me. That kind of knowledge is too much for me. It's so high above me that I can't fathom it. Where could I go to get away from your spirit? Where could I go to escape your presence? If I went up to heaven, you would be there. If I went down to the grave, you would be there too. If I could fly on the wings of the dawn, stopping to rest only on the far side of the ocean, even there, your hand would guide me. Even there, your strong hand would hold me tight. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, for decades, even centuries, the majority of humans spent their lives living in the same communities or the same tribes with among or with the same people. They learned together, they played together, they worked together, they married one another, and then they raised their children together who continued that same cycle. In the last century or a couple of centuries though, probably really with the advent of the Industrial Revolution, 
we become a much more mobile society. Now the number of folks who spend their entire lives in the same community is significantly lower. I believe the statistic is something like less than 25% of people stay in the same community for the duration of their lives. And of course, the result of all this mobility is that we build connections with others and then we move and those relationships, for the most part, are severed. Now, that would not seem to be a really significant problem considering that we are also a much more globally connected society than we once were. You know, through technology, phone, email, social media, video chat, we are able to maintain personal relationships even from across the globe. But the problem is, as I think we've all experienced, social media isn't really all that social. You know, Zoom, it just can't substitute for laughs around a common table. Somehow on a, a bad day or in the midst of difficult times, a, a sad-faced emoji is no substitute from, for a real hug from a person who really cares for you. And in the same way, you know, posting a note about something great that's just happened, that's not the same as, as getting together and celebrating with your friends and your family. And so the result of all of this is that we are confronted with loneliness on a regular basis. And of course now, more than ever, as we seek to keep one another safe and healthy through less in-person interaction. And the truth is, this kind of loneliness hits a spot of fear in all of us. Did you know that there are studies now showing that loneliness or isolation can have negative effects on our physical health? In fact, chronic loneliness is as unhealthy to our bodies as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. We were not made to be isolated. Now that's not to say that we don't all need some solitude sometimes, some time to get alone and be by ourselves for, for silence and, and reflection now and then, but that's different from isolation. Taking some me time is a far cry from the experience of loneliness and isolation that weighs heavy on the hearts of many, especially right now. You see, the thing is, we are social beings. We were created even for relationship, for companionship. Just think about this. It goes all the way back to the very beginning of the Bible and creation. This is part of our God-given nature. We were created by God to be in relationship with God and with one another. And so when you look at those creation stories, you'll remember that God, he spent day after day creating, and each day he got to the end of the day and looked at what he had done, and he said, it is good. But then in the second creation story, after creating man, God looked at the man and said, it is not good that the human is alone. And so the first thing that God's eyes saw among this, uh, this human, Adam, was his isolation and how that was not good. And so God created a second human, a companion for the first. Companionship is at the core of who we are as humans. And when we're isolated, when we are alone and lonely, that is not good. So it's only natural that this is something we fear. And yet, there are times in our lives when this is our very real experience, isolation and loneliness. It doesn't matter even if we are surrounded by thousands of people or sitting on the couch next to our spouse. We can still, even in those moments, experience feelings of loneliness. And the greater the isolation we feel, the more our thoughts and actions become shaped by those feelings. We begin to assume the worst about things that are happening around us. Let me offer an illustration because this is something I do quite often. I know Ken does this as well. You might do it also. I have this experience. You know, we imagine our entire futures based on one event. 
And in our minds, we work out exactly how something is going to happen. A lot of times when we're feeling lonely or isolated or afraid, we're interpreting people's actions and thinking about the future based on those feelings. So for example, you know, a coworker doesn't greet you in the morning in the same way as they usually do, or a friend doesn't answer the phone or respond to a message for a long period of time. You know, most likely when something like that happens, it's, it's, there's a simple explanation. You know, our, our coworker just might be a little busy or distracted that day, or our friend is, is in a meeting or has an appointment and then got busy and forgot to get back with us or, or whatever, but for some strange reason, such rational thoughts like that are not usually what come to mind for us. So whatever the impetus, our, our imagination almost immediately goes to work imagining the worst case scenario. We wonder what we've done to make the person mad, or we think that something about ourselves has changed that makes us unattractive, and suddenly that person doesn't want to want to be associated with us anymore. Are these thoughts that you all have? You know, sometimes this happens. We have these negative thoughts, and then the person calls us back later or greets us the next day, and, and we're able to move on and, and forget about it, and it's no big deal. But there's also other times when we experience this repeatedly or our thoughts get the best of us, and the isolation continues, and so our uncertainty grows. And then when that happens, we begin to withdraw. We don't want to experience further rejection, or we feel like we are unlovable or that we'll never have friends, and so we avoid relationships altogether. Of course, I don't have to tell you that when we withdraw like that, it only isolates us more. Or as we are literally experiencing right now, being isolating is sad. And so we get caught in this perpetual downward spiral. And so again, we we can understand so easily why we fear being alone, why isolation causes us to be afraid. You know, as much as I would like to, to think otherwise, I think occasional feelings of loneliness are just a fact of life. Because we are so mobile, because our family and friends are mobile, because of death, we will have these times in our lives when we feel isolated and disconnected. And because this is pretty much a fact of life, then it's only natural that, that we would fear such times. But how do we deal with these feelings of fear related to, to isolation in a way that we don't get so caught up in, in it that it becomes this downward spiral of ever-increasing loneliness and, and separation? Well, for starters, we have to recognize that relationships take some work. As much as we expect people to greet us and to return our messages, we must do the same for others. If we want to be surrounded by others who can comfort us and celebrate with us, then we have to make ourselves available to do the same for others. Do you know what the number one indicator of happiness is in retirement? Just a hint, it's not the size of your 401k. The primary indicator of happiness in retirement is relationships. And so as much as we work on our 401k, we should also be working to build relationships that will last. When we move, which for the average American now is 11.7 times in their lifetime, we need to make room in that move to get to know people and to build new relationships. And that's true now more than ever. And here's the thing, we can still work toward building and strengthening relationships even in this time of increased isolation. Still, though, it seems kind of flippant to say if we don't want to experience isolation and loneliness, we just need to work harder at getting to know people. There is, of course, a lot more to it than, that, than just that. These are real experiences and real feelings, sometimes that are beyond the realm of our control. But the good news is that in our faith and in our God, we find a presence 
that addresses the loneliness and the isolation that we feel. To start with, Christ has given us the church. The church is a community of people who come together and find connections as brothers and sisters in Christ. The church is a community of people who love one another. The church is an assembly of people who grow together in their relationships with with one another and especially their relationship with God. We fear loneliness because we were made for companionship, but, but God has also made for us a place to build relationships, to find companions. The church is that body. And so it's important for us to be active in the church, but also to be a strong community together. It's important for us to be the church, not only for companionship in our lives, but to be the companions to one another who are needed so greatly. But even more than that, we need to know that in God, we are never really alone. As St. Augustine once said, You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they find rest in you. Remember this. God created us to be in relationship with him. And Christ Jesus has made a deep, personal relationship with God possible. God loves us so immensely, and God never leaves us alone. That's what Psalm 139 that we heard earlier is all about. God formed us, and God shapes us. God knows our thoughts even before we think them, and our words before we, we speak them. The psalmist says that God hems us in, behind us and before us. That God places his hand on us. It's like a hug. That's how close God is to us. And there is nowhere we can go to escape God's presence. Not to the farthest reaches of the ocean. Not even to death. God is with us always and everywhere. There's a veteran of the Vietnam War who tells a very powerful story, and of course, knowing the nature of that that war, I imagine that this story isn't unique to him. This particular soldier was captured by the Viet Cong, and as was the case with nearly all captured soldiers, he became a prisoner of war, and he was imprisoned in solitary confinement. He was beaten and starved and tortured in an attempt to get information out of him, and he remained in solitary confinement for five years until the war eventually ended. Whenever this gentleman is asked about his experience and how he survived five years of solitary confinement, His answer is always the same. He says, I remember that I was never really alone. Friends, as isolated as we may be, as lonely as we may feel, we are never alone. We can use our imagination and and imagine the worst and, and withdraw ourselves from certain scenarios, or we can set our fear aside and instead imagine the truth that God is with us and that we are loved more than we can ever believe. Know this. Have faith in this. You are loved. You are never alone. And with God at your side, everything will be okay. Let us pray. Almighty God, we come into your presence this morning as a people who, in isolation right now, are experiencing a great loneliness and because of that sadness. And so in your presence, we seek comfort and solace. And we pray, Lord, that you would carry us through this time 
and all times of loneliness and isolation. And that through that, we might know your love and your life in the most powerful ways. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Today is World Communion Sunday. And normally, when we come together and celebrate World Communion Sunday, we are doing so with believers all around the world. That's not necessarily happening this year, but the message of this day and this moment is perhaps more relevant right now than it ever has been. And that is this, no matter where we are, no matter how we are coming together in worship, when we share the bread and the cup, when we gather around the Lord's table, we are one. We are one with Christ, and we are one with each other. And so I invite you to this table this morning, all who come seeking God's presence and God's nearness. You are welcome in this place. Let us prepare our hearts and minds to receive this meal. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, Christ took bread. He gave thanks to God, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then when the supper was over, he took the cup. And again, giving thanks to God, he gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood, the blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one. One with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Because there is one loaf, we who are many, scattered though we may be, are one body. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ, and the cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in Christ's own life blood. I invite you now to share with one another these elements and this meal. This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. Will you bow with me in a word of prayer? Gracious God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that in your presence we may give ourselves by the strength of your Spirit to one another and in that way experience companionship and life and love today and every day. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
jealous for me. Love's like a hurricane. 